الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وإيمانا وتقا وإحسانا يا رب العالمين اللهم جل عمالنا كلها صالحة ولوجهك خالصة ولا تجعل لأحد منه شيئا Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may Allah's peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his noble companions and all the Muslim believers who live until the day of Al-Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us our good intentions and all the deeds that we do with the hope of gaining Allah's pleasure and reward. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them from us and reward us abundantly. Ameen. Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, the study of Quran in itself is a noble deed that could gain us a lot of merits and they could also create within ourselves a great change which is why we have been encouraged to study the Quran and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam described the people those who study the Quran and teach the Quran as the best of the people so they are simply the best, the people who are engaged in studying the Qur'an and people who are engaged in conveying the message of the Qur'an, they are among the best of the people. But what is the purpose of studying the Qur'an? Why are we studying the Qur'an? We are understanding its meanings. Is it just to remember them, to listen to them? No. The Sahaba, companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it has been narrated that if they study 10 verses of the Quran, they will not move on to the next 10 verses until they implement what they have gained from those 10 verses that they study. So the purpose of studying Quran is not just to, to listen and to be amazed by what is being said there but for us to derive lessons that could help us put them into practice in our day-to-day -day life and it is this practical aspect of the Quran which is important so in Surah Ar-Rahman we are studying a lot about Allah's creations about the beauty of his creations, about the uniqueness of his creations, about the amazing functioning of these creations. So all this should make us, make us think about how it is possible that all these creations function in a meticulous, proper, balanced manner so we should think about this so the more and more we recite about Allah's power his magnificence and his creations the more it should make us ponder over the ayah the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this universe and we should remember that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that war to be upon those who recite the verses of the Quran and do not ponder over its meanings. So pondering over the meanings of the Quran, the verses of the Quran is itself a meritorious deed and it is what is expected from us when we read the Quran. We are going through Surah Ar-Rahman. Let us go to the following section which is the third section that we are going through in this chapter. This chapter which is the 
55th chapter of the Quran and we said that this surah was is a Makki surah which was revealed in the latter part of the uh, Makkan era. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Maraja al-bahrain yaltaqiyan Bainahuma barzakhu la yabghiyan The verse repeated in this surah, Fabi ayi ala irabbi kuma tu kaziban. Means that Allah is expecting from us that we are grateful for the favors He is bestowing upon us. So therefore, the gratitude that we show to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes from our acceptance of His mercy and blessings. If we refuse to believe that all what we have on this earth, all we, what we are benefiting from in this world, comes from Allah, then we cannot show our gratitude to Him. We cannot thank Him. Which means that we are falsifying it. We are rejecting it. We are rejecting the fact that all these came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why Allah is saying again and again, which of the mercies, the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do you falsify? Do you reject? Again and again Allah is asking. So the first part of the surah is speaking about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the skies. Allah began by mentioning the sun and the moon and how he raised the the sky high up. Then Allah spoke about man himself and how Allah created man. And now from verse number 19, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is 
speaking about his aya his signs that are found in the seas so he spoke about the skies and now he is speaking about the seas allah says maraj al bahrain yaltaqiyan maraj al bahrain yaltaqiyan he released the two seas or he let them flow he let the two seas flow and they meet side by side now if we look at these words we find maraj means to something is kept tied or something is kept within barriers and you let let it go that is called maraj or for something to go to to gush out without control is also called maraj so allah is saying he release the seas which means the seas always move here and there that is the nature of the sea for the wind and the currents and so many other factors make the oceans make the seas move within themselves but even with this movement allah is saying maraj al bahrain yaltaqiyan the two the two seas he allah is mentioning about two seas and he is saying that these two seas meet together they meet together they are moving and they meet together so what happens when the sea, two seas two seas that are moving meets together they will mix together that is what is naturally expected from such a movement so allah is first saying maraj al bahrain yaltaqiyan bahrain is the dual of bahr bahr bahran if it comes in the 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 the, the nasab or the jarr form it will be bahrain so the bahrain is the country bahrain it is because bahrain is situated in a place where the two oceans ah situated so maraj al bahrain yaltaqiyan yaltaqiyan comes from the word verb laqiya or iltaqa which means to meet liqa is a meeting liqa is a meeting so maraj al bahrain yaltaqiyan both seas are let loose they flow and they meet together but allah says now before we go to the next part of this verse or the next verse let us see what the scholars say about this two seas now there are different opinions expressed in the books of tafsir there are some who try to define which of the oceans these two seas refer to some say this is the pacific ocean and the atlantic ocean some say is the mediterranean and the uh, red sea and there are so many different opinions given in the books of tafsir so that could be one opinion but there is another opinion which says that the two seas mean the salty water and the pure water which means the salty water is found in the seas and the pure water is found in the streams and the rivers and so on but is it only in the streams and rivers that we can find pure water no even in the middle of the sea we find some areas where you can find pure water it will be inside the ocean itself and such places have been found such places have been found out for instance there is a, 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 a Uh, a person a turkish national who wrote a book some many centuries back uh, about the nations 
then he was speaking about a particular place in the Persian Gulf where there were springs of sweet water in the middle of the ocean. If you extract that water from that place, you can drink it. And even the Americans when they came to the Middle East, they were extracting water and making use of it from this place until they dug the wells in other places in the lands. So, this is one view that has been expressed about finding pure water in the middle of the oceans. Similarly, it is also said that in the seas that are close to Bahrain, there are a lot of places from where you can extract pure water. So, whatever it is, Allah here is mentioning about two seas and we still cannot definitely say what these two seas refer to. However, if we look at the next verse, we will be able to come to some conclusion as to what Allah is referring to. So, what is the next verse? Allah says, Bainahuma barzakhun la yabghiyan. Bainahuma barzakhun la yabghiyan. Between them is a barrier so that neither of them will transgress over the other. So here Allah is speaking about barzakh. Barzakh, what is barzakh? It is a barrier. There is an, a world called Alamul Barzakh. Do you know what the Alamul Barzakh is? Yes, the Alamul Barzakh is the world where you will live in after death until you are resurrected. It's called the world of Barzakh because it divides this world life with the hereafter, from the hereafter. So, what divides those two lives is called Barzakh. Similarly, Allah is saying that there is a Barzakh between these two seas. And it is so that these two seas, even though they meet together, will never mix into one another. It's like they are being divided by a clear barrier. So, Barzakh la yabghiyan. Bagha comes from the word Yabghiyan comes from the verb Bagha. Bagha means to transgress. Al Bughat are the people who do sin, who transgress the bounds of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. Or the people who go against the ruler of a country. Ahlul Baghi, the people who sin and the people who go against the rulers of the countries, they are all called as people who transgress. Bugat, Al Baghi. So, Bainahuma, between those two, those two seas which Allah mentioned, there is a barrier. La Yabghiyan, they will not transgress upon each other. So, now where is it in this world that we can see such barriers? Number one, we can see such barriers in between oceans. In between oceans. The scholars, scientists have seen that each ocean, may it be the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean or the, uh, any other ocean, each ocean has its own specific characteristics. The components of each ocean differs from the other. But even then, we cannot see any ocean losing its, its nature, its natural composition. It never loses it. So this is an amazing thing Allah has created, which the scientists are still unable to explain. How is it that these oceans which constitute three-fourths, three-quarters of the surface of this earth with all that water and with all the winds and so on, these oceans are not mixing with each other. So there is a clear barrier between them. Then we also mentioned about pure water in the middle of the ocean. So that too shows that this salty water is not mixing with that pure water. 
then we also see that sometimes when the river water goes and falls into the sea you can see the difference between the river water and the sea water in the place where the river water meets the sea a couple of weeks back i was in trincomalee and we went to see the place where the mahaveli river falls into the sea and you can very distinctively see the difference in color in the middle of the sea you see the color difference between the actual sea and the place where the river water goes and falls into the sea so there are several examples as to how allah has made the two waters in the ocean not to mix with each other maintaining their own characteristics own specifications so the seas even though they meet together and they flow here and there allah has created them in such a way that they do not transgress now the word transgress here is important because transgress means you are exceeding your bounds you are passing your limits and if you pass your limit if you exceed your bound you cannot maintain your balance you are going to an extreme in the previous part of the surah what was allah speaking about wal sama rafa'aha wa wada'al mizan we raised the skies and created a balance in it allah tatghaw fil mizan so you too do not break this balance maintain that balance even in your lives even in your activities maintain that balance wa aqimul wazna bil qist wa la tukhsiru al mizan so here again allah is showing us yet another example as to how allah is maintaining this balance in all his creations whether it is the sky or the seas so maraj al bahrain yaltaqiyan bainahuma barzakh la yabghiyan it will not transgress over one other then allah is saying fa bi ayyi ala rabbikuma tukaziban so now this was yet another blessing that allah has spoken about so he is asking us even after this are you able to falsify the merits or the favors of your lord then allah is speaking some more about the oceans he is saying that these oceans yakhruju minhuma al-lu'lu'u wal-marjan from both of them what are the both of them the two seas he was speaking about from those two seas come the lu'lu and the marjan the pearls and corals emerge come out from these two seas kharaja means to come out khuruj means exit min huma means from those two min huma al lulu lulu is pearls pearls but uh, there were some different opinions among the companions or the tabi'in uh, for instance ibn abbas radiyallahu anhu and some others they were of the opinion uh, that lulu is pearls whilst there were some other scholars of tafsir like mujahid and qatada who said that lulu means corals but the most widely accepted uh, meaning for lulu is that it is pearls so allah is mentioning the pearls and marjan is coral now both are valuable things that are found in the sea in the sea so the per- pearl is formed actually from a kind of living being which is a bit similar to a snail which has a, a shell now this living being goes deep into the sea and lives there and it protects itself from foreign objects entering its shell but when it happens that sand or small stones enter its body it at once mixes them with a type of sticky substance which after the lapse of time form the 
pearl and this pearl is safeguarded within that shell and it is after fetching those pearls and extracting it from within that shell that we are able to get hold of it. So, this is one of Allah's marvel, marvelous creations in the sea. Similarly, the corals. The corals also a great and wonderful creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are beautiful and they are with a variety of colors. And maybe the Red Sea was named after these corals because the most uh, beautiful is the corals which have the shade of red and the Red Sea is filled with places which have a lot of corals. So, uh, these corals are a creation which like living beings uh, grow and they fetch or catch their prey. Now, the corals stretch out and catch the prey and feed themselves. And do you know that these corals, when they procreate or they, they are uh, their reproductive system, when they reproduce, the new corals always form, always become part of the existing coral, which means once we, are, once human beings give birth to a child, the child is able to, uh, to, uh, to be separated from the parents. But the corals that are formed are not separated from the original coral, which means that they keep on growing. Which is why we see in places like Australia, there are some concentration of corals which stretch out for miles, like thousands of miles, they stretch out. So, this shows that these corals are an amazing creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because they are both valuable creations and they are both beautiful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made them precious and made them as a means of jewelry to adorn the women among human beings. So, this is yet another favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed his creations. Because human beings, so we nature. were speaking about the corals and the pearls that could be extracted from the deep oceans and how they are a source of adornment for human beings. So this is also yet another favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed upon human beings. So again Allah is saying, which of the favors of your Lord do you deny? So here Allah is, was speaking about the seas and the amazing structure of the oceans and the beautiful things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created within those oceans. So the seas itself are a source of inspiration to man that this entire universe is being controlled. And these oceans also play a great role in maintaining the balance of the earth. Maintaining the balance of the earth, the, the heat of the earth. And uh, it, the oceans help uh, prevent various harmful uh, substances that are excreted from the earth from entering the atmosphere because the earth from deep within is continuously letting out various poisonous gases and these are prevented from entering the atmosphere which will harm human beings. And then we also see the balance in between salt water and pure water. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the seas makes the water rise and then purifies it 
and brings it down as pure water in the form of rains. So all this is a big system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is operating without any role played by human beings. So this cannot happen on its own. There should be someone who is making it happen. And that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If a place does not get rain for some time, we know what a lot of difficulty the people are going to face. So it is something that people need. So if Allah is going to give it to us free of charge, without any effort from us, then it should be a great favor that Allah is giving mankind. So how can we not thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for these favors? That is the message Allah is giving here. Having spoken about the seas, Allah is now speaking about yet another aspect of the oceans. He was speaking about the creation of the seas, the things that are found within the seas. Now how we are able to make use of these seas? And to him belongs the ships with sails elevated in the sea like mountains. If you look at the words we see Walahu, Lahu means to him, for him. Li means for me. Al Jawari comes from the verb Jara. Jara means to run. Flowing water is called Alma Al Jari. Alma Al Jari, flowing water. So this Al Jawar comes from the verb jara which means to run so ships when they sail in the sea it is known in arabic as to run in the sea to run in the sea in several other places in the quran allah mentions this word al jabari or its singular form is jaria jaria the plural is Jabari, Jariya Jabari. Now, Jariya has another meaning in Arabic, which is made. Made. Do you refer to ships as she? Ships are referred to as she. Maybe that is what this is the reason. Uh, so, the ships are named as Jariya or Jabari because they run or sail or move fast on the water. al munshaat elevated, comes from the word nasha'a. Nasha'a is for something to grow or so, something to be erected. Erected. So munshaat has two meanings. It could either mean that the ships themselves are elevated. The ships are elevated. That means when you look at the sea, you see the ships high like mountains in the sea. And it could also mean that these ships travel even in the high seas. It will be lofty. It will be sailing as if it is climbing mountains up and down. So, walahul jawari al munshaat. Now why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attributing these ships to himself? He is saying, and for him, to him belongs these running ships, these climbing ships, belongs to him to show that if not for Allah's favor, man will not be able to sail the seas. Why is that? Because how is it possible that these seas do not uh, take in the ships and other things that sail on it? How is it possible that these ships sail on the seas without drowning? It is an amazing thing. Because even heavy things like ships are able to sail on the seas without going under the water. So this shows that there is some power that is holding it. 
and that power could be explained through science and it could sometimes not be explained but that doesn't matter whether it is scientifically proven or not we know that it is happening and it is happening because there is a force that is operating it that is making it happen so walahu al jawari al munshaat fil bahar bahar is the sea kal alam alam is the plural of alam alam is flag so those days the ships had sails so they sails were like flags in the sky so allah is saying that these uh, ships will be sailing in the seas like flags now alam has another meaning which is the one given here which mountains so the ships will be sailing elevated in the seas like mountains so both meanings are given for this whatever it is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directing our diverting our attentions to the ships because they are a form of transport and they help maintain the balance in human life again we are going back to the balance that is the amazing thing the surah how it speaks about allah's creations the wonders of allah's creations and also pinpoints towards the balance that is maintained in all these creations how are the ships maintaining the balance in this earth in sri lanka you get a lot of tea in saudi arabia in iraq you don't get a lot of tea there you get petrol so how can we get that petrol here and we send our tea there how is this balance maintained in the world where there is excess of wheat they export it to a country which has excess of silk and this country which has excess of silk exports it to a country which does not have silk and in such a manner the balance is maintained in this world and what helps us do it the ships which freight all these commodities and all these goods so allah is referring to the ships as a sign of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that even these ships help maintain the balance on this earth allah tatghaw fil mizan then allah is yet again saying fa bi ayyi ala rabbikuma tukaziban so as we said last in our last lesson the reason why allah is repeatedly asking the same question is that allah in this surah is addressing a group of people who are stubborn and we need to repeat it again and again until it reaches their minds now allah is speaking about something different after having mentioned about the universe so we are amazed by this creation but when we are amazed with the skies and the seas and everything that is around us we sometimes forget the reality of these creations we think that they are staying with us for good but allah is saying it's not so it may be beautiful it may be useful but it is not going to last forever it is going to go into extinction kullu man alayha fan every one or everything because here allah is using the word man it is every one every one upon the earth will perish kullu means everything kull man means a person a person if it's a something with that does not have life how do you say kullu ma kullu ma ma is used for what that does not have life for what that has life we use man so kullu man alayha fan everything or everyone alayha what is that alayha referring to on it on what earth earth is used in arabic as the feminine in the feminine form so kullu man alayha fan all that is on the earth are going to fan comes from the word faniya faniya of fana 
which means to perish. So everything is going to perish, going to simply disappear. Why is Allah saying this? Because before in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was referring to this earth as a place he has created for human beings. Allah was saying in the Quran, وَالْأَرْضَ وَضَعَهَا لِلْأَنَامِ In verse number 10 of Surah Ar-Rahman, Allah said, وَالْأَرْضَ وَضَعَهَا لِلْأَنَامِ Allah created this earth for whom? For the people. So we think, ah, okay, this earth has been created for us, so it's going to be with us forever, and we are going to be able to live on it forever. But Allah is saying, no, you are all going to perish, and with you this entire earth is going to perish. But the earth will perish. Everything that is on it will perish. There is one thing that is going to last. There is one thing that is going to exist eternally. And that is nothing, none other than Allah himself. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ And there will remain the face of your Lord, the owner of majesty and of honor. Yes. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ Not Rabb, it's mentioned وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ We'll see why that has been mentioned in such a form. وَيَبْقَى comes from the verb بَقِيَ which means to remain. Now if everything goes away, there is something that will remain. بَقِيَ يَبْقَى وَيَبْقَى وَجْهِ is the face. وَجْهُنْ وَجَّهْتُ We say when we do takbiratul ihram which means I have turned my face wajjaha means to turn your face towards something rabbika means your lord so wajhu rabbika what will remain the face of your lord the face of your lord who is that lord zu al jalali wal ikram this word zu we have mentioned it before zu is for for masculine and Zat is for feminine. So, Zu here is referring to Allah. Zu al Jalali wal Ikram. Allah is the owner, Zu al Jalal of majesty, and He is the owner of al Ikram. Al Ikram means honor. Al Ikram is honor. So, majesty and honor belong to whom? Belong to Allah. And it is Allah alone who is going to remain, who is going to exist. وَيَبْكَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ So as you asked, now why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned his face and not mentioned his name? Because sometimes people of dignity and people of honor and people of status are not referred to by their names. Neither are they referred to by their position or rank. For instance, in our diplomatic circles, we see them using the word your honor. For judges, diplomats, your excellency, your honor. Now, excellence and honor don't refer to the people themselves, but refer to a characteristics or to some quality that is found in them, that they are worthy of being honored. So we address their honor and not themselves. So we, what is the sign of honor, dignity? It's one man's face. The sign of honor and dignity is his face. So by mentioning the face, you are able to give two meanings. You are referring to Allah, at the same time you are referring to His, His might, His greatness, His magnificence, and so on. 
So Allah wants to give both meanings through this. That everything will perish, but what will not perish is what truly has this characteristics of magnificence and of uh, nobility and so on. So why is Allah saying this? كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْكَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Because Allah was in the previous verses mentioning about His favours to mankind. And He has mentioned those creations as things that He has created to benefit human beings. But what happens is when human beings try to benefit from them, make use of them, they forget the real purpose why they were created. They try to earn them more and more and through that they try to live a comfortable life. They think that this worldly life is all that they have to experience and therefore we should not lose this chance. But this is where they forget that all this is going to come to an end. We are going to die and this world is going to be destroyed, going to perish. And then after that what is our situation? What is going to happen to us? We are all going to return to Allah. Which is why Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-Kayyisu man dana nafsahu wa amila lima ba'd al maut a wise person is one who subdues himself, who humbles himself to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and works, does amal for the sake of which comes after death, not for the sake of which comes before the death. We are working in order to gain what we are able to gain before death. But are we working for things that we are going to gain after death? Very little. Very little. But compare it with our worldly life. The life of Al-Akhirah is going to be eternal. But still we are not preparing for that life. Even a fraction of what we are preparing for this life. So here we are lo losing focus on our mission. A student who goes to sit an exam, he is given a limited time, two hours or three hours, to write that exam. What does a student who sits for an exam does do in the examination hall? Does he take the comb and comb his hair? Or does he dress nicely? Or does he look at the teacher and uh, see what he is doing? No, he is busy with his pa exam paper because it is for that reason that he came. So he doesn't want to waste his time. He is concentrating on his mission, on the work. But we human beings came to this earth for a test, for an exam. And that exam paper has been clearly given to us, conveyed to us. In the Quran and in the universe, all these signs have been given to us. But we are not concentrating in answering the questions that are being posed in those exam papers. This question, for instance, for bi ayyi alai rabbikuma tukadiban. Are we answering that question in the proper manner? Have we prepared for our life after death? Are we showing our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his favors upon us? No. Then we are not concentrating on the examination that Allah has given us in this earth. So how can we get the results in the hereafter? How can we succeed in the hereafter? That is the question Allah is conveying to us through this verse. Then Allah is again saying, فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِبًا Which of Allah's favors are you denying? Then Allah is asking or telling, يَسْأَلُهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي الشَّانِ now Allah, how did Allah say in the previous verse? He said that everything is going to perish except for Allah who is the owner of magnificence and nobility. 
So now Allah is mentioning about his nobility, about his greatness. He is saying, يَسْأَلُهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ All that is in the skies and all that is on the earth, keep on supplicating to Allah, asking Allah. كُلَّ يَوْمْ Every day he is bringing about a matter. Let us see what that is. Yas'aluhu comes from the word sa'ala. Sa'ala is to ask. From that comes the verb, word su'al, which is question. So, ask him, who asks him? Man fi samawati wal ard. Man is a person or who? Fi means in. A samawat is the plural of sama. Sama'un. Samawat. Then we have al ard, earth. So, all that is on the earth and the skies. Whom do they ask? They ask Allah. Now this is yet another place where we fail to maintain balance. Now we fail to maintain balance. If we want to maintain the balance on this earth, then we have to always place our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we place our trust in other creations, whether they are human beings or they are material uh, beings, then we will lose the balance on this earth. If we lose the balance of the, in this earth, we will not receive the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is saying, everything that is on the skies and the earth, yes, aluhu, they ask Allah, how is it that you approach other human beings and ask them when they themselves are dependent on Allah? Even all that is on the sky and the earth, they are asking Allah. Why only you are not asking Allah? In so many places in the Quran, Allah is repeating over and over again that Allah is always on the lookout for those from among his servants who ask him. Allah is happy when someone asks him. Whereas in this world, we see people when they are asked for some favor, their faces they will, you will see only a frown in their faces. So Allah is saying, in the, for instance, in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي أَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعْنِ When my servant asks of me, say to them, O Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ I am close to him. أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعْنِ I answer the prayer of the caller when he calls me, when he asks me. And we know that Prophet Muhammad wasallam said that every day, every night, in the latter part of the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends to the lowest of heavens and he calls out, who is it from among my servants who is prepared to ask from me? I am prepared to give him what he asks. So we are not maintaining that balance in our lives. We are not placing our trust in Allah. Yas'aluhu man fis samawati wal ard. Then he is saying, Every day he has a matter. Every day he has a matter. Kul yawm is a day, hua he, fi is in a matter. What is Allah saying? Allah, the way he administers this world is amazing. One day you see a person. He is able to find his sustenance. He is able to amass wealth and live comfortably. The next day, you find that he is bedridden and all his wealth is being spent in order to treat him. So today Allah was kind to him and the next day Allah was not kind to him. Is that so? No. Allah has his own way of managing things. Sometimes we will be able to understand it. Sometimes we won't be able to understand it. One day you will see the weather is very nice, calm and so on. The next day you will find the weather has completely changed and it is difficult for you to even get out of your house. 
So why has Allah done like this today and is doing like that tomorrow? This is how Allah is managing this earth. This is how Allah is making things function on this earth. And this is how Allah is maintaining the balance in this earth. Why is Allah making one person poor and making another person rich? To maintain the balance. If everyone are rich, the rich people will not be in need of, the, of any other's service. Then who is going to serve the rich people? Who is going to serve? Everyone has money. But you have to buy the service. But no one is prepared to give you a service. No one is prepared to work for you. Because they also have money. Then who is going to do things for you? No, there should be a balance maintained. So this shows the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is saying, Kulla yawm huwa fi sha'an. Every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a particular way, a manner by which he administers things. So every day there is a matter that is cause for our consideration from all what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does on this earth. Then Allah, that with that verse 30, the passage which is speaking about uh, Allah's creations and the wonders of Allah's creations and all are coming to an end. And here Allah is beginning another section in the surah. And that section begins with a threat. Allah is threatening the human beings and the jinn. Sakalan means uh, two things, or it could mean prominent beings, prominent beings, but it refers to the man and the jinn. Man and the jinn. Sanafrugu. What is that sanafrugu? Comes from the words faragha. Faragha means to completely. Uh, now, if you remove your clothes completely, or if you commit yourself completely, if you free yourself completely for something, then it's called faragha. Now, what is farag? Farag is a space which is empty. It's called farag, a vacuum. It's called farag. Now, the leisure time. What is a leisure time? A leisure time is a time when you don't have any work to do. So it is called waktul faragh. So sanafruhu means I will leave everything and concentrate on you. So Allah is saying, I will completely attend lakum to you. I will completely attend to you ayyuhat thakalan. When someone is doing some thing that is challenging for you. How do you threaten him? You say, wait, I'll come. I'll look after you. You say, I will take care of you. That is what Allah is saying here. Oh, you people, you are not obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are failing to show your gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not maintaining the balance in this worldly life. I will take care of you. O oh people, I will take care of you. Why is Allah beginning with this threat? Because the verses that follow speak about the day of judgment. Al-Akhirah. So before that, before Allah mentions about Al-Akhirah, He is conveying this threat to the man and the jinn to make them alert, to make them mindful of what is going to happen to them on that day of judgment. So it will make them think, why is Allah threatening us? Why is Allah saying, I will take care of us? And here, we should look at the, 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 the ferocity of this threat. How severe this threat is. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the same time, He is looking after the entire universe. Not even a leaf falls from a tree without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Attention, He knows. He knows what is happening. If a black ant crawls on a black rock in the darkest time of the night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows it. So he is doing everything at the same time. So does Allah need to completely attend to someone in order to punish him? 
He does not need. If Allah wants something to happen, He will just say kun and it happens. So the fact that Allah is saying, I will take care of you, shows that Allah is going to do something very severe to us. So it is a very big threat that Allah is giving in this verse. Sanafruhu lakum ayyuha athakalan. So what happens after this is what we will go through inshallah in our next lesson. So this part of the surah was speaking about yet some other wonders of Allah's creations. And these wonders too on the one hand show how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bestowed his favors upon us. And they also show that all these creations work in conformity to the rules and the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has determined for all his creations and they do not transgress upon one another which is what the same thing Allah expects from mankind and the jinn that in their lives they should maintain a balance they should not go to extremes they should not concentrate only on the worldly life and forget their life in the hereafter they should not concentrate only on material gains but should also concentrate on what they are going to gain in the hereafter. They should not concentrate only in the beauty of the creations but they should also concentrate on the benefits of those creations and so on. So these are lessons that we can derive from this section of the surah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with this Quran and help us understand its meanings and bring them into practice in our practical life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our sins and the sins of all the Muslim community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help the Muslims, the needy, the poor and all those who are facing severe hardships all over the world in the people of Nepal and people all over the world who are, uh, who are being tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them. May Allah also help our Muslim brothers in countries that are facing uh, severe challenges. Uh, they are being, uh, they are facing the atrocities of the enemies of Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save them and protect them and protect the lives and the property of the Muslims everywhere. Ameen wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. إلى الذين آمنوا من الصالحة تواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر جزاكم الله خير